Like, so those of you who are taking the course rather than listening, I think, well, maybe we can t I'm, I don't know the format, so I don't know what's uh, required, but I have problem sets that I can give you. I think that's probably the best. If you want to do a research project, that's even better. Um, but we'll, we'll maybe talk that over with Andre when, once he arrives. Okay, so, yeah, so today I'll talk a little about the first people who worked on surface tension and why they were interested in it. Um, and then some more about uh, why surface tension is important, how, uh, why modern uh, scientists are concerned about surface tension, and then we'll start getting into the physics of it. So where, where does it come from? Okay, so the first people to look at uh, surface tension, so Hero of Alexandria was called the greatest experimentalist of antiquity, and he was... Uh, these were the good old days where people were mathematicians and engineers and uh, philosophers and artists all in, in one. And he uh, came up with a number of uh, inventions describing, uh, or which relied on surface tension. So in particular, he looked at um, clocks, a water clock. So if you have a water clock, um, so let's just imagine we have, we have a continuous flow of fluid somehow, and we want to make it discrete, right? So we want something which counts seconds. So how do you do that? Well, you can do that with surface tension. If you have a continuous flux Q then the, of water, then basically, uh, if we know it's coming out of a tube here, the, it will uh, grow until reaching some critical volume, which will know, uh, soon know how to do, and then it will pinch off and release a drop, okay? So despite the fact that you have a continuous flow, you get discrete uh, drops emerging. And this was a sort of basis for the first clocks which were developed by uh, Hero, okay? And um, Pliny the Elder was a, uh, another sort of polymath who was good at everything, um, and he described the glassy wakes of ships. So if you see ships, when you notice ships coming into the harbor, you'd see that there was a very, uh, despite waves just about everywhere, there were regions where it was completely flat. And this has to do, as we'll see, with the uh, entrainment of, of uh, biomaterial. So biomaterial is this waste from, which is suspended in the water column. It's actually surface active, which is to say it sticks to the interface, it reduces the surface tension, and makes the interface behave like an elastic. And so, so this is why when you're swimming in a pool if you, or swimming in, the, in a lake, if you swish water up, you get these flat regions. And so he noticed this in the, in the um, wake of ships. And I also like, I just li I like this quote a lot, which is really why I in, uh, included Pliny the Elder. And then he mentioned uh, truth coming out in wine. So we mentioned this last time, and so this is the first, uh, so this was written by uh, King Solomon, thought to be the wisest man that ever lived. So if we were to translate this into f into a Brazilian, it would say, stick with the wine and don't touch the pinga, okay? Because, um, so they that, so this is old English, so I don't know, uh, uh, who hath sorrow, who hath woe, so who, who's uh, sad, those that spend too much time with the wine, um, then don't look, a lot, don't look at the strong red wine that moveth itself right, which means that it climbs in the glass. Um, at, the, at the end, it bites like a snake and stings like a different type of snake, an even worse snake. Okay, so, so when it says moveth itself aright, so this is of course a, a translation from the Hebrew, but I had a Hebrew scholar translate this, and uh, it, it, it always says when, that moveth itself aright, so it's, a, it's true that when you have a strong liquor, then the, f the fluid actually climbs in the glass, okay? And so this is true in wines, particularly fortified wines, so port, and, so, and I was explaining this last time, but we'll, we'll go through it again um, in case you didn't catch it. But if you, so if you have this thin layer of wine, which you get from taking a sip or swirling your glass, then uh, the, you get evaporation of alcohol. So it's basically an alcohol water uh, concentration. Uh, uh, sorry, alcohol water and some sugar. This is basic, basic, the basic ingredients of wine. And... Uh, alcohol is volatile, so alcohol evaporates from everywhere, but because in this thin film region you have a large surface area to volume ratio, 
relative to the bulk, right? So the same amount of evaporation here will decrease the alcohol concentration much more than in the bulk. So the thin film then becomes depleted. It has less alcohol than the bulk, which means that its surface tension is higher. And the surface tension is a force between at length, so it's a tensile force, and this then pulls fluid up the sides of the uh, glass. Uh, and, and so you have a flux up the walls of the glass, and this uh, gives rise to this band. So fluid sweeps up to it, hit, hits the top of the film, then it accumulates in this band, which then eventually falls owing to the influence of gravity. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> so again, uh, this is something he the, in the in the Bible, uh, King Solomon is in uh, Proverbs is warning against uh, drinking the sorts of drinks which uh, do this, and cachaça certainly does. Okay, um, <clears throat> so, so this is also surface tension is also considered by Leonardo da Vinci. I have a friend who's uh, insistent that Leonardo da Vinci is is um, given too much credit for all of the uh, inventions in the world and he says that it's, and he insisted it's because um, uh, the Europe did not want to give credit to the Arab world so a lot of great uh, scientific inventions came up through uh, North Africa through the Moors into Spain and then they were, when they were expelled from Spain suddenly uh, Leonardo da Vinci is credited with having invented everything and there's even some indication that he uh, had access to the uh, Arab libraries but in any case he was uh, he did rep he, it is sort of true that I, I mean I, I don't know the extent to which this is true but uh, it is true that a lot of his he sort of has very heuristic you know has a sketch of a helicopter it's like ah oh, da Vinci invented the helicopter and so forth so it's not entirely clear uh, what his contributions were and the extent to which he was uh, uh, simply publishing others' ideas. But in any case, he did report capillary rise. So capillary rise, we know if we have a, a, a straw, uh, if, we, if we put it in water, then the water will climb up the straw. And the, the, the smaller the straw, the higher it will go. And so he suggested that mountain streams are being fed by a capillary network. So you imagine you have a mountain which has tiny cracks in it, and the, the water is in... Uh, he suggested that the water is then uh, climbing up spontaneously through capillary action and feeding these streams. Okay. So Francis Hawksby uh, was, I'm always interested, as you can probably tell from that last um, digression in scientific history and um, in particular <clears throat> scientific scandal and sc <laughs> Uh, Newton, there are all, all sorts of nasty stories about Newton, but here, here's another one. Uh, Frank, uh, Francis Hawksby did these experiments on capillary rise, and they were very carefully done. But uh, it was, this is basically described by Newton, and no, uh, who gave no credit whatsoever to Hawksby. Um, and now we have, uh, which is why there's no picture of Hawksby on Wikipedia. So, uh, but here we have, so Benjamin Franklin, he was an uh, American polymath, politician, scientist. He looked at, he was, uh, as we mentioned last time, he was interested in, he noticed when he was traveling in Bermuda that the spear fishermen, to, in order to uh, flatten the surface, they would throw oil on the water to uh, uh, suppress the waves and so, uh, and so not distort, uh, make it easier to hit their targets. Um, and I think it's interesting here because he was, so he did this experiment and he was, um, so he's basically looking to see how large, uh, how far a, a teaspoon of oil would spread on a pond. So he looked on a stationary pond, and if he could, if he'd asked the right question, he could have got something much more important, which is the size of the molecule. Because if you put down, uh, if you uh, put down a a, a a spoonful of oil on water, it will go out to one molecule. And so from this, you can calculate the size the size of uh, of the molecule from the area. Of the and the initial volume. Okay. Andre, welcome. So the next, so now things start getting a little more serious, and people start writing down equations. Uh, Laplace was a French mathematician and astronomer. And he looked at uh, the meniscus. So the meniscus is the shape of an interface when it adjoins a solid, um, and. Uh, 
he, so this is called, the, I call often a curvature pressure, or Laplace, Laplace pressure is a pressure that arises as you cross an interface, and it's proportional to both the surface tension and the uh, local curvature of the interface. And this is called, the, uh, again, the Laplace pressure. So Thomas Young was uh, another uh, so-called polymath, which means he's basically good at everything. Um, he did solid mechanics, so Young's Law. Uh, he was a scientist. He also translated the... Um, the Rosetta Stone. So he was an uh, yeah, incredibly talented character, and he also looked at uh, n the nature of light with ripple tank experiments, and he looked at the uh, description of, uh, he looked at the wetting of a solid with the fluid. So when you put a blob of fluid onto a solid, what shape does it take? There's something called Young's, uh, Young's Law, which we'll come to uh, next class. Okay? So Plateau was... Um, <clears throat> a actually a Belgian scientist, but he was working in Paris. He lost his sight, but continued to work through his uh, uh, son-in-law in the laboratory. So he did a lot of work on soap films, uh, minimal surfaces, drops and bubbles. He was interested in modeling the shapes of planetary bodies, so astrophysical bodies, planets. We know uh, they're basically... Uh, gravity wants to keep them spherical, but rotation is dis distorts them into oblate uh, spheroids. And uh, so it's, of course, very hard to model gravity in the lab, but you can use surface tension, because surface tension also wants to maintain the sphericity of a body, so you can then uh, have a, a balance between um, surface tension, which keeps things spherical, and rotation, which again flattens them out. And so it turns out that the progression of shapes you get when you have this balance between surface tension and uh, rotation is the same as the shapes you get when you have gravity and rotation. So he's actually, he actually modeled then the instabilities you get in uh, uh, astrophysical bodies, so in heavenly bodies. So but it's kind of interesting because you have, and we'll actually go through this, but if you have a uh, rotating sphere, bound by surface tension or bound by gravity. Uh, as the rotation rate increases, it goes from spherical to oblate, so it's basically axisymmetric, but then at a, at a critical value, it goes, it goes into hot dog shape, right? So it actually breaks axisymmetry, and then these things will go unstable. And that's true with when the uh, restoring force is either gravity or surface tension. Okay, so now we get into who cares about surface tension. Um, apart from me, and, uh, and hopefully you. So the, the, first th people, the, the first things to care about surface tension were bugs. So as we'll see later in the class, surface tension dominates gravity uh, on a scale to small relative to raindrops. That is to say, when things are on the order of millimeters, and uh, most creatures, are, most uh, uh, creatures, certainly all insects, have functions uh, which operate on that scale. Okay? So, so uh, if you actually look at the distribution of the size of all living creatures, there's a huge peak in the insect range. So there's an incredible amount of diversity in the insect world, and these guys live in a world dominated by surface tension. So uh, for the last uh, 10 years, I've looked at a lot of uh, mechanisms arising in biology dominated by surface tension. Okay? Um, so... They use surface tension for weight support and propulsion at the water surface. They have to be able to deal with raindrops. They have to survive raindrop impact. Um, we saw last time that they can adhere and de-adhere to surfaces so they can climb walls, they can uh, climb ceilings using surface tension. Um, and th these are some rather... This is one of the strangest things I've ever seen, actually. Okay, ready? So this is the, these guys use bubbles for hunting. These shrimp are its prey, they say. It deals a knockout blow from a distance by using its claw as a sonic weapon. 
burst its claws cocked like a pistol. Then fired. The effect is literally stunning. The sound effect. As the I know, I know. shut, it fires a blast of bubbles. Incredibly, as the bubbles collapse, they momentarily reach the temperature of the sun. This implosion causes a shock wave that stuns. Right, and so, so they basically release a jet of water and the speed is so high that you go below the cavitation pressure. So that's the pressure at which bubbles come out of solution. And so uh, then these bubbles uh, are, uh, collapse and the, and the resulting shock wave stuns their prey. So they basically direct the bubbles towards the, towards the prey and stun them. Okay? And, so and, Pressure wave that yeah, that's right. That's right. So the closer you get to the bubble, the better, right? But um, and and they said that it gets the temperature of the sun. There's something called sonoluminescence. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it was some, it, there's something just discovered about 10 years ago, which is that if you get a uh, you just get a bubble vibrating at the right frequency, then it will start luminescing. And there were all these theories about how does this work. And these guys have been doing it for millions of years, right? So it's exactly the same phenomenon. So again, whenever you come up with a clever idea, you, nature's probably got there first, and this is another example. What's the temperature of it? It's, it's, I, I don't know, so they, said, they say the temperature of the sun. I don't know exactly, uh, that might, they, might just be, yeah, they might just be making it up. But, but, this, but it is true, so, <laughs> but, but this, um, this collapse of bubbles near boundaries is very interesting because they actually spike and they give rise to, this is why submarines, when uh, depth charges do in submarines, it's not from the actual explosion, it's from the collapse of bubbles near the hull. It turns out you get really high pressures as bubbles collapse near boundaries and that's, uh, that's what does the damage, but we'll come to that problem later. So that was using bubbles to hunt, so these guys clearly care about surface tension. And here's another thing that cares about surface tension. So these guys use drops. There's a great shot at the end. But again, yeah, you have to get this right, right? And if the, exactly, if the thing breaks off in a different way, you're going to get the trajectory is going to be off. So they really have to get it right. And again, they've simply evolved to do this. I don't think they're doing their math before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is great. Archers target anything that moves or glows. <laughs> so, uh, right. So those are some. Again, I'm always amazed by the sort of the range of the range of mechanisms which nature uses, and these those are some some nice examples. But we also we discussed yesterday. So these creatures that are that they will breathe underwater uh, by trap, but they're so water repellent they trap a layer of air through which they breathe. So they basically have an external lung which is supported by water repellency. And then they're diving. 
uh, spiders, so these guys basically form a net and then uh, which captures a bubble and they use this as a sort of diving chamber and so they go they hunt underwater and they return to this bubble uh, to breathe so that they don 't have to surface uh, on each dive um, okay and we 've discussed a little natural strategies for water repellency and we 'll get into that. Um, the hydraulics of trees is strongly influenced by surface tension, so whenever you have very small uh, um, um, constriction, so when you have a, a pathway of fluid which is very small relative to the capillary length, which we'll define soon, basically anything on the order of millimeters or smaller than surface tension is going to come into play if there are interfaces. Okay? And so lungs and surfactants, so uh, <clears throat> when in infants, it turns out, the uh, common difficulty they have is taking their first breath. It's because they have to, over, they have to create the energy uh, required to coat the lungs. So basically, because you're going from something with no surface energy to, to basically breathing air into the lungs, you're creating a huge surface area. And oftentimes they aren't strong enough to do this, particularly premature children. And so they uh, actually inject surfactants. So surfactants is something which decreases the surface tension, so it decreases this energetic cost of expanding the lungs. Okay, so who else cares about surface tension? So it actually comes up in uh, geophysics and environmental science. We wrote, I wrote a review on this uh, recently. So the dynamics of raindrops, we all know that rain is important. Um, I, I was uh, curious to, to learn that they actually, they, there's even some suggestion that there's feedback between um, uh, the rain and, and life itself. So. Um, <clears throat> Turns out that most biomaterial, so again, any spores or anything created by living creatures is surface active, so it tends to stick to the surface of drops and bubbles. Um, and so, uh, as a result, whenever you have a lot of interfaces, so for example, in the surf zone where you have breaking waves, there's a lot of biomaterial accumulated, and a lot of the exchange between uh, the biosphere uh, on the terrestrial and the aquatic biosphere happens in the surf zone. Okay? And there's even suggestion that. Um, uh, rain would not, f rain will not form, rain, uh, let's say, rain forms much more easily if there's dust in the atmosphere, there's stuff floating around, and bi uh, biomaterial in particular, and so when you have a forest, it will kick up lots of dust and bring, uh, and so increase the likelihood of rain. So in some sense, there's actually a feedback between rain and life itself. Okay, um, and uh, this, uh, in, in terms of modeling early life, there's a suggestion that uh, the first, so, so we know that you can have the spontaneous generation uh, of um, amino acids if you take carbon dioxide from, from as I say, uh, spontaneous creation of amino acids from uh, inorganic materials, so from carbon, from nitrogen, from oxygen, such as one expects to have on, in the early Earth just by sparking it. So they've done this experiment. You just take these things, put it in a spark chamber, and you get the spontaneous creation of amino acids, which is a basic building block of life, but then they have to combine. And so to, as you get these lower order uh, life forms uh, being created, the, li the likelihood of them combining and making larger ones is going to be higher if they're at an interface Okay. And also if they're contained. And so there's suggestion that the first vesicles, which would contain such material, come from bubbles coming, passing through interfaces. They come through interfaces. If these interfaces have surfactant on them, have this chemical, then if the bubble goes up and then falls through, then you'll get a bilayer of surfactant. And this could be the first model of the vesicle. Okay? And so uh, it is, there is some suggestion that interfacial effects are important in models of, the, of early life. Okay? Um, okay, so all of these things, uh, oil recovery, so there you're pushing oil uh, through, or water through uh, oily sand or oily ground, and the ground is, has uh, very small uh, pore space, and it's basically pore, flow through porous media, when you have interfacial flow through porous media, the uh, interfacial effects are dominant, so this is true for both oil recovery, uh, carbon sequestration, and groundwater flows. Um, the early work on water repellency was done by people who were designing insecticides. And it's kind of a tricky problem because you, have to, you want to kill the insects but not harm the plants. And you're basically hitting them with a toxic chemical. And typically, plants and animals co-evolve. So basically, uh, the um, insects will evolve so that their surface 
is almost identical to that of its host. Okay? And so they're equally water repellent. So you have to, you have to try and find uh, chemicals which will stick to one and leave the other one unharmed. Right? Okay, uh, uh, so, so water repellency of soils. There's, uh, if you have chemical leaching, so we have some soil which is rich in, ingre- in um, nutrients. And then uh, if you get uh, droughts, and, and then you have some rain, then it can be that the, you'll get leaching of all of the valuable chemicals, and so you'll get the spreading of deserts as a result of uh, uh, interfacial effects. You then basically get a water repellent, so this, this, the soil starts to become water repellent, and the, and the water just rolls off and collects all of the, the nutrients which you actually want to stick there, so it uh, comes in there. Okay, um, um, uh, so, yeah, so the, something that I'm actually working on now is disease transmission via droplet exhalation. So uh, I have a, a postdoc who's done some rather disturbing experiments where they look at sneezing and coughing events. And uh, it turns out this is um, the, 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 range of the, the range of the pathogen-bearing droplets is strongly determined uh, by the interfacial dynamics because right? they're basically trapped on, uh, trapped on these drops which are carried in a cloud. Okay, um, so dynamics of magma chambers and, and volcanoes. So this is another uh, geophysical setting where um, surface tension comes in. Basically, if you have a volcano, uh, it, it's degassing. Um, uh, that is to say the pressure is decreasing as it rises, and so gas is coming out of solution. So then you have these uh, bu- uh, sort of bubbly column of fluid coming up from a volcano. Okay, so you have this, you have this two-phase flow, and this can give rise to, if the bubbles grow enough, then you can, you can get a substantial volume fraction, and it'll actually fill the entire column, and then you'll get these eruptions happening in a regular way, and it's a, basically a divide between fluid, as the fluid and the gas are expelled. And my favorite, this is my favorite, have you ever heard of these ones, the exploding lakes of Cameroon? Okay, so this is a nice uh, mystery. So here's a, a mountain. And there's a lake at the surface. And this mountain is an extinct volcano. Okay? And so <clears throat> there are a couple of villages along the sides. And they wake up one morning and everyone in the village is dead. Okay? So that's the mystery. How did that happen? It's like hundreds of people, and it happened several times before they figured out what was going on. Okay, and this is actually, uh, <clears throat> so this is the explanation. So again, it's an extinct volcano, so we imagine there's some sort of source of magma, and then you have carbon dioxide leaching into the lake okay, from, ben- from belief, beneath. So if we do a zoom on the lake, the lake, so this is the lake now, and we have this, carbon dioxide going in. So you actually get a layer at the bottom which is very rich in carbon dioxide. And the, um, uh, so this is then like, a, basically like a, a Coke bottle. You have this, is this carbon dioxide, it's rich in carbon dioxide but under pressure. But if you can perturb it some way, and basically they think there was some wind uh, causing the sl- uh, sloshing mode, and then so then you basically perturb this interface, and you perturb this interface, and so you decrease the pressure locally, which means you get this, so the bubbles start. Okay, and so then there's this eruption of bubbles, and the only clue they had was that in the morning they looked and they saw that the 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 lake looked like it had belched, like literally the water level had gone up by a meter and then come down, and this corresponded to the degassing. So then you basically get this bubbly plume, and the and the entire uh, all of this carbon dioxide was released at once. Okay? So you get this cloud of carbon dioxide coming up. Carbon dioxide is uh, heavy relative to air, so it then poured down the mountain and suffocated the people in the villages. So there's a... And that was, a, that was I think, in the 90s. And so what they do now... Uh, or in the 80s, and what they do now is they, and this will only happen in, in uh, sort of equatorial regions where you're constantly heating from above, so they're basically getting more and more stratified, so there's no overturning of the lakes. So what they do now is they artificially bubble the lakes, so they basically have bubbles going 
uh, all year, and so this basically mixes the lake and keeps this sort of uh, stratification from happening. Okay. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> so the so if we look uh, more recently at who's interested in surface tension, uh, most of the mo uh, funding going into surface tension research was coming in through the space agencies. So in outer space, of course. So I've said that surface tension dominates gravity when we're small relative to a raindrop, but there is no gravity in outer space. So surface tension is actually very important. And so if you have uh, if there's a, for example, a fluid spill on, the, on a space shuttle, the fluid will just drift around. It won't fall to the floor. It'll just drift around. It can do all sorts of damage to the electronics. And so you can actually get the fluid to move using capillary effects. So if you have a drop here in zero gravity, and it turns out if you put a heat source here, it will spontaneously move towards the heat source. And we'll work through that problem. Uh, but so here, just to show to you that, oh, wait, we missed. We missed this one. Let's take a look at the let's take a look at the wine tiers. Yeah, so these are the these are the tiers in case my explanation wasn't clear. It's not very good looking wine though. So these are again from multimedia fluid dynamics. But so, so now so now he's, he's just generated a, a thin film. And now we're going to zoom in and see what you see on the film. So you can do this yourself over dinner. And you see these tears forming along the side of the glass. And that's owing to the depletion of alcohol and so the increase of surface tension in the thin film. Okay, and so, and so here's a large, so this is an air balloon in uh, zero gravity. So you basically, so, so uh, you basically pop, yeah, water balloon, yeah, and you just pop the elastic band, but the fluid just floats around because it wants to stay together because of surface tension, yeah. Okay, and so we mentioned, we mentioned uh, when we were looking at the pistol shrimp, these um, uh, bubbles exploding near solid surfaces can do a lot of damage. When, if you look at propellers on boats, there's often pock marks on them. This is because of the explosion of cavitation bubbles, or the implosion of cavitation bubbles near the propellers. Okay, and, and we mentioned the damage uh, done by submarines by depth charges is similar. It's the, from the collapse of bubbles. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so not, there's been a huge uh, resurgence in interest in uh, wetting effects, and a lot of it is being done by David Carre and people in, in Paris. Um, they're basically designing superhydrophobic surfaces. They can do this now because of my advances in microfabrication techniques, but they are basic, so they can now design self-cleaning windows, uh, drag-reducing surfaces, erosion-resistant surfaces, uh, by combining chemistry and texture. And their ideas are coming from nature. They're looking to see how leaves do it, how, how bugs do it. Okay, and then we have uh, lab on a chip technology. So you have medical diagnostics and drug delivery. So patches you can put on your arm, which actually deliver drugs uh, automatically. Um, on a, and again, here you're trying to move fluids around on a small scale using capillary forces, something which nature has been doing for a long time. Okay, and we have uh, so microfluidics, continuous and discrete fluid transport and mixing. So again, moving fluid around on a small scale. Oh wait, so so here, for example, oops, what just happened? Did I just accidentally move a slide? I did just move a slide somehow. There, there we go. Yeah, so here, if we look at um, these are drops bouncing on a fluid surface, you can imagine sorting. So let's imagine you want to get drops of all one size, and you want to turn them into, into uh, medicine. 
of a given volume. So actually by putting fluid drops on a surface and vibrating at the right frequency, you're going to select because only some of them will bounce. And there you can see merger giving rise to, and, and then uh, uh, giving rise to sorting. Yeah. And you can also mix uh, with a process like this. So this would be called discrete uh, microfluidics because you're looking at the microfluidics of individual parcels of fluid or droplets. So here you start with the oil water and you can basically emulsify it via bouncing. Okay, and, um, <clears throat> okay, and so uh, another, uh, another area which is well funded in terms of sur uh, for surface engine research is people that are interested in tracking submarines. So as we mentioned with Pliny the Elder, uh, you have whenever you sweep up biomaterial to the surface, you make the, you make the surface uh, uh, effectively elastic and this suppresses small capillary waves. Okay, ink, inkjet printing, we all know about that. Again, it involves, uh, strongly involves capillary effects, so you basically want a, a stream of drops of uniform size, so uh, the really plateau instability dominates the dynamics there. And then we have the bubble computer, so this is something that was developed by a graduate student of mine. I don't actually under, know anything about computers, but if you do, then maybe you'll be able to tell me uh, how this would function as a computer, but it's kind of a cool video. Um, so here, the bits are the bubbles, okay? So this is, the, they're able to transfer uh, informa information via the, and I think the, the Russians did a lot of work on this in the 60s. They were interested in having computers that would function even in the case of electrical blackout. Okay, five minute break. <laughs>